Welcome. This is week five of our six-week series called Darwin and You. My name is Arno Moores, and I am the moderator, and uh, it is an exciting evening for me. We uh, had a long list of potential topics we, when we first started thinking about this series. Uh, we had Darwin and your pets, Darwin and your garden. Uh, we had a whole long series, and this was one of the ones that kept bubbling up to the surface, Darwin and your sex life. And we kept pushing it back down because we weren't sure we could do it. Um, but I'm very uh, happy to say that uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Ellie, um, who studies sex in plants, agreed to take on this task. Um, you've seen, as it looped through, that Darwin uh, wrote uh, a two-volume book uh, called The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex. At the end, it was 1871, I think, so it was, it was long after he'd written The Origin. He spent a lot of time thinking about this topic. Uh, it's obviously a very difficult topic because you can't do experiments on people. Um, but we'll see how far we get just by thinking about it. Dr. Ellie uh, hails from Long Island. She did her undergraduate in SUNY, so uh, State University of New York, and she also did a teaching degree um, at the same time as she did her undergraduate degree, or just after, uh, in biology. Um, she did a PhD at Rutgers, uh, then she went did postdoctoral work in California, and she came to Simon Fraser University in 2000. She's also my associate chair, and she sits on the Outreach and Education Committee for the International Society for the Study of Evolution. So thinking about how evolution impacts and how it should impact everyone is actually very much part of her job. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Ellie. How's everybody doing tonight? Good. You like that music? Is that good? <laughs> How to have some sex music. Um, actually, I'm going to start with uh, what the great Cole Porter once said. Birds do it. Bees do it. Even well-educated fleas do it. Let's do it. Let's fall in love. That's what tonight is about. It's spring. Yesterday's snow notwithstanding. And sex is in the air. You know, it just is. And... What we see is we, we see the chickadees singing their sweetheart song. We see the trees literally throwing sex out in the breeze. Before you know it, the wildflowers will be going, and then the bees will be buzzing. The birds and the bees. That's what it's all about. And I think there's something just really sexy about springtime. You know, there's a certain urgency to sex at this time of year. Maybe that's why February is the month where we celebrate sex. And when you're thinking about sex, when you're looking for a mate, it pays to advertise. And we might appreciate the beauty of a peacock, but he's not doing it for us. He's doing it for the peahen. She's a pretty inconspicuous but a discerning little creature. Darwin pointed out that there's no obvious way that peacock's tail is directly linked to his survival. In fact, it might be a liability. He can't hide too well. That big tail makes it easy for predators to catch him. His great insight, Darwin said is, in the book Selection in Relation to Sex, was that for some traits, it's just not logical to interpret them as having evolved due to natural selection. If you've been attending this series, you know that where there is variation in the population, variants that leave more surviving offspring will spread in populations via what Darwin called natural selection. In this later book, he suggested that the same mechanism can work for traits that do not of themselves confer survival value or greater ability to leave offspring, but rather greater luck at the mating game. We can summarize it by thinking about Shoes. <laughs> the original theory of natural selection can be thought of as a flat sandal, which would be very useful for a fashionista to wear so she doesn't fall off the runway and break her neck. Alternatively, sexual selection is like those fancy heels that are going to help her snatch a mate. 
birds probably have one of the most amazing arrays of mating displays, not just peacocks. Birds of paradise have not only stellar equipment, but great tricks for showing it off. It's a combination of behavior, sound, and an almost shocking appearance <laughs> that mesmerizes the female. <laughs> She doesn't quite know what to do. <laughs> she has to go think about it. It's a bit, perhaps, deflating for him, as we'll see. Oh. <laughs> now, Darwin pointed out that such displays absolutely require some explanation. <laughs> so do these bowerbirds build beautiful bastions to love. All those twigs get stuck in the ground. They do it differently, different species of them. And then they decorate it. And different species use different kinds of decorations. The most obvious difference here is the color of the decorations used. And there are fashions in decorations as well. So we see that in some areas, um, blue bottle caps apparently are considered sexy. And largely, that's because the color blue is attractive in this species. In other areas, perhaps some a little further away from our activities, it would be the blue wing covers of beetles. They have quite the flair for decoration, and they relatively steal decorations from other males. And if some silly scientist goes in and moves around the display, he'll come back and put everything back in its proper place. He'll even be, they've been known to steal things from scientists trying to study them, like their socks. Females come, check out the real estate, and if they like it, they'll respond to the male's advances. Amazingly, these structures have no other purpose. The whole point is just showing off the male's talent as an interior designer. Advertisements, of course, are not limited to birds. We see beautiful coloration across a diversity of animals, often focused around the face, but not always. Uh, uh, what we're seeing in the corner is uh, a mandrill has beautiful blue and red coloration on his face. He also has a lovely blue scrotum. <laughs> Perhaps not for public consumption. I shouldn't say that. You'll see some photos later. <laughs> um, in, these, in all of these species, these things are either limited to or showier in the males. A really common advertisement of virility isn't about color, though. It's about beards. So there's a male and female bee mating. The male is on top with that great mustache. We see beards in fish, in sooty mangabees, and of course, really good ones in people. <laughs> Darwin wrote extensively about beards in different human cultures in his book, Selection in Relation to Sex. Perhaps he had a special interest in them. <laughs> He wrote of an Anglo-Saxon law where every part of the body was given a value. The loss of the beard being estimated at 20 shillings, while the breaking of a thigh was fixed at only 12. Clearly, beards were good real estate. How can we understand the purpose of beards? Well, I don't know if purpose is the right word, but we can study the psychologist's favorite study organism, undergraduates. And we can ask female undergraduates what they think of beards. And they tend to rank beards as in, in high virility, very attractive, really sexy, good mates. Um, and that might be why we see some celebrities with this kind of scruffy in-between thing going on. And that's because female undergraduates also say that they associate beards with things like homelessness and being marginalized in society, which perhaps gives us an idea of what this most recent incarnation of Joaquin Phoenix is like. It's so disturbing, isn't it? Not just because he can't rap, either. The combination of a beard and pattern baldness, though, is a clear signal of maleness. Although our closest relatives don't have beards, they have both baldness and interesting hair growth. It's extremely common in primates and does tend to be sexually dimorphic in many, although not all, species. <laughs>